of speakers. Uh, we have Professor Titiyal, Dr. Arup Chakravarti, Dr. Sudeep Das, uh, Saurabh Patwadhan, Deepak Megur, uh, Minu Mathan, and myself. Uh, we just wait for the speakers to come in. Dr. Saurabh has to rush to another place, so we will uh, get him to speak first. Fellow AC and small pupil. So Dr. Sarab is here uh, to speak first, and then he's got to rush for the judging session. So, uh, if there are any questions, we'll take them at the end of his talk. Thank you, Sarab. Thank you, uh, Dr. Swain, sir, for inviting me for this uh, very, very useful instruction course on small pupil. I think uh, you are playing from there. I think one of the you know things which I always hear from my trainees and fellows about whenever any complication occurs, you know, their statement starts with, then the pupil became you know small, and then this and this and this happened. So I, I always tell them that small pupil should not be an excuse for making a complication. So I'll be talking about a deadly combination which is shallow AC along with small pupil. So when we have shallow anterior chamber, that means there might be associated zonular weakness. There is al always inadequate visualization because of small pupil. There is a higher risk of iris prolapse with shallow AC, probability of aqueous misdirection on table, inadequate staining of the capsule, and there is always, because you have very small working space there, risk of endothelial damage is there. Now, I, I want to show you some tricks, you know, to determine how the surgery is you are planning. So, how do you determine whether there is significant phacodermis is not before you plan which type of, you know, pupil expansion device you are using? So, I just take a simple Sinsky make the entry and after that, just after putting the staining and OVD, I just touch the anterior capsule and try to move that, move that yeah, lens like around. So if there is significant like amount of movement of the lens Hold noted, the then I generally go with the iris hooks because I want to assess the zonular damage all throughout the procedure. But if it is not significant movement, then I can go with B-hex, which is my pupil expansion of, the expander of choice. Another thing to show here, how to, stain the entry capsule under the iris because many times there is small pupil to begin with. So if you just stain in that area, the periphery is, remains unstained and you may have trouble while doing rexis later on. So stain under the capsule and then use heavy, high, heavy dispersive, my choice is hylucot. And bef whenever you have these rigid pupil, before using B-hex, it is better to do little bit of stretch pupiloplasty and then put the B-hex ring inside. Of course, more uh, about the B-hex ring, I think the inventor himself will later deal with. Some of my choices with B-hex is, uh, one good thing is it's very, very thin profile. So even if there is shallow anterior chamber, it doesn't have any issue. I generally try to put the sub flange under the iris so that I, that avoids the problem of IOL haptic getting entangled with the B-hex. Now, whenever you have a small pupil shallow AC, always the, uh, you know, good size of CCC is must. This is another problem with many surgeons do is that they make a smaller rexis, even smaller than the pupil size, and then you'll end up with more trouble. In generally with shallow AC and pupil expansion device, I uh, remove the uh, BHEC device under visco only because if you try to do hydro explantation, there is a higher risk of iris prolapse. Now I want to show a case of nanophthalmos where there is extremely shallow AC, hardly 1.2 millimeter anterior chamber there, with intumescent cat tract, one-eyed patient, with iris is almost completely plastered to the anterior lens surface. So again, I tried staining the capsule under the iris, but it was not possible because of Sinecki. So now I'm going to put hylucot and release the Sinecki first. Sometimes you may find a pupillary membrane which you can remove, but sometimes pupillary membrane is not there. So you just have to separate the Sinecki using any blunt instrument like iris repository is, uh, or you can use a blunt Sinsky hook as well. And then a little bit of stretch pupiloplasty before we put the B-hex. Uh, frankly, this uh, B-hex has worked for me in all these cases, particularly shallow AC because it has such a thin profile that anterior chamber is not lost. Now, once B-hex is inside, we have pupil of adequate size. So that particular problem of the in the case is now solved. 
Now once we have that in space, now you can see the entry capsule is not well stained because of the thing that I could not stain it under the iris. So what you can do, and uh, this you can just paint the entry capsule under the viscoelastic which you have used. Of course, it is always better to have a cohesive OVD under which you can stain it much better way, but you, it's possible to do under dispersive also. After that, I have removed the OVD and again check the staining is adequate, then I have again replaced the OVD, otherwise I can remove and restain. So always make sure the entry capsule is well stained before you start. Again, after making the first nick, because this is an intumescent cataract, I just aspirated little amount of cortical, cortical matter there so that there is no problem with the intumescence later. And again, uh, with this very, very small eye with intumescent cataract, I have to make sure that still I get adequate size of the capsule axis so that I don't do further zonular damage while I'm removing the cataract. So all throughout, always remember, whenever there is any doubt, always use pupil expansion devices or iris retractor because small pupil should not be an excuse for any complication. So in this case, it was a very large uh, customized IOL. It has a lenticular design, so usually overall thickness is not that high. Uh, and uh, the thing about, as I told, that trailing haptic, you have to be a little bit careful while using pupil expansion devices that it should not drag that device into the bag along with it. So you have to be a little careful while doing that. Make sure it, you do it carefully, and then you remove the pupil expansion device. The next case I'm going to show, that is the common problem of iris prolapse, which happens here, nasal side, this is again one-eyed lady with adherent leucoma on nasal side, the iris is almost plastered to the antechamber. You can see after putting the air also, it's plastered. And only in the temporal side, there is some amount of anterior chamber, so I want to make insane in the temporal axis. And now watch, I had stained under the iris, I had put trypan view and this happens. The iris starts prolapsing. So now let's think, whenever there is an iris prolapse, we have to find out what are the possible causes in that particular case. Like it can be OVD overfill, it can be a short incision or very large incision, posterior entry, raised IOP, raised intraorbital pressure, floppy atonic iris, small pupil, shallow AC. You first find out what was the cause in that case and then move forward so that you treat the cause. So find and treat the cause. So what was the cause in this particular case was the trypan glue which I had injected got trapped under the iris and when I injected the OVD, I did not, you know, make the uh, movements from periphery to center. In, in fact, I, you know, just injected from one end to another. On the other side, the iris was plastered, so trypan glue got trapped in the sub iris and it, uh, you know, caused the iris prolapse. Now just see, as I release the viscoelastic, the trypan glue is trying to come out but because I have used heavy dispersive OVD, the OVD is not coming out easily. So now my plan is to have two incisions for bimanual, then another two incisions, little posterior scleral for making, uh, putting the iris hooks because I want to, you know, drag this iris back a bit so that I can do the rest of the manual. So now I'm going to release the OVD from the anterior chamber and watch, that was the cause, the trypan glue trap behind the iris and once I release that, I could easily put back the iris. If I would have tried 100 times to put that iris back, I would have just damaged the iris and nothing else. Now I use iris retractor to pull the iris back. Maybe I could have used one more under the incision so that even that iris is protected. You can see on the nasal side when I tried to put the iris hook, in fact, because of the adherent leucoma, it went behind the iris. So this was a reverse iris hook which was used. <coughs> the capsule axis was done in the usual way again. You even if there is a small CC, you should avoid very, very tiny capsule in these cases. Always detrimental for your surgery, zonules get damaged if you have very small rexes. Now, one thing is that always put the FECO probe inside the AC without irrigation on. So if you keep the irrigation on and enter the AC where there is already, al already iris prolapsing, the irrigation enters the AC first and then it causes more iris prolapse. So follow this ritual, put the irrigation off, go in, while before taking out, make sure you stop the irrigation, let there be a little bit of hypotonia and then come out. Always in these cases avoid, uh, you know, temptation to keep on pushing the iris back inside. Rather complete your procedures, avoiding further damage to the iris while using the, uh, putting the IL also, you can put little bit of heavy OVD over the iris to keep it back and then you can put the IL so you avoid further damage. Once everything is done, your AC is hypotonous, then you can safely pull, the, pull back this iris. Now I will suture the incision before I remove remo remaining amount of OVD so that I don't have now any iris prolapse further. 
and that way you can manage a case where there is already a iris ruler. Thank you so much, Dr. Suvain. Thank you, sir. Thank you. So, uh, I will meet the surgeon. Uh, so, uh, I keep this topic for him every time so that he gives you a better perspective because SICS and small people is an issue which uh, where you don't have too many devices to use. So, go ahead. Yeah, thank you, Suvain. Uh, great be have, uh, being back on this course. This is very, uh, it's a very popular course in the AOS for many years now. And uh, SICS, considering uh, iris expansion, pupil expansion devices are not required, uh, I don't believe in that. I, I always feel that the pupil should be large enough to do a good SICS. So if uh, the pupil is small, do not hesitate in putting iris retractor hooks. At any stage of the case also, you can put iris retractor hooks. So it is not a question that you cannot put it after, after trying to prolapse or whatever. So I'll be showing you in uh, uh, different scenarios where you can use iris retractor So the ring possibly is not possible. Iris retractor hooks are to be used. And how they can be used? There are, see, you just saw one iris retractor hook being used. Uh, there are different companies which make iris hooks. There are very thin ones which go in through even 0.25 millimeter opening. So identify those. I don't have any financial interest in that, but the Alcon ones and the Aurolab hooks, which they make are very small, so that you don't have to make a la uh, more than 0.25 uh, uh, incision for this. And the incisions have to be stab incisions at the limbus. So it should not go through the cornea and then enter, because it has to be in the plane of the iris, and it has to uh, retract the iris in that plane itself. Otherwise, if you go through the cornea, it will retract the iris up and the anterior chamber will be crowded. Here, the m there is a added problem that you need more anterior chamber in SICS because you need to have uh, space in the anterior chamber to get the nucleus out into the anterior chamber. And also, uh, the incision, when you make an incision, at least six to seven millimeter incision, then these nuclei has to come out through that. And the iris, if you put iris retractor hooks on the sides of your incision, it usually lifts up the iris a little bit. Then your manipulation of instruments going through uh, the uh, incision will again damage the iris which has been retracted up. So to make a la the uh, problem in SICS is there are two. One is you need to have a very large rexus. Second, you need to bring the nucleus into the anterior chamber. FACO you don't have to bring. You need to have just the pupil size rexus so it can, you can just make it five millimeters and then do it in the uh, bag. Oh, finally, half of the thing was shown without this. And uh, uh, so uh, the, the other problem is that we have to bring out a nucleus. Bringing out a nucleus needs a larger rexus, especially if you are more than grade three nucleus. So uh, the nucleus size decides the size of your rexus in an SICS, not like in a FACO when you have a set nucleus size, uh, pupil uh, rexus size in this. No financial interest in this talk. Problem, I told you, large rexus and the nucleus. See, if you have a small rexus, you pupil, you tend to make a smaller rexus and you do forcible hydrodissection and you see the pupil snap now. The pupil just now snapped because the fluid goes behind with a smaller rexus, the nucleus lifts up, flu fluid collects behind and snaps open. It uh, blocks the rexus. So we will tend to create a smaller rexus when you have a smaller thing. So here, in an SICS, you can sometimes get away with uh, in rigid pupils, you can get away with stretching. Some are fibrotic pupils, which may get, you will get small time uh, uh, sphincter tears when you do this. Not in very elastic ones. Elastic ones, you do this, it will come back to the normal size or even become smaller. So here, the, the tightness of the, uh, the pupil is also gone. And also it will give small sphincter tears. And with this, you can even make 5, 5.5 pupil. And the nucleus, even if it is so large, it can come out through the pupil because it is stretchable now and the rigidity is gone. In a, a moderate pupil, so if you do not want to use that, but you need to do a larger rexus, you have to do it under your iris. So again, this needs a lot of practice, but even if with practice, you should look at the flap which is going under the rexus. So two strokes away from the center, two strokes towards the center. Then it can retain the uh, rexus margin somewhere under the iris. It's all a blind thing, but then it won't go to the periphery. So if you notice, two strokes is, are away from the center of the pupil, two strokes are within towards the center. Then you can make it large enough, but still, I don't know what is the size of the nucleus, this uh, capsular rexus. So the nucleus may not come out that very easily. So I would not want to do all these blind procedures in SICS. So this is the 
very small pupil. So this is my, my point. Creating an incision which is sub-incisional. That is through the floor of the SICS tunnel. And that will retract the iris at the incision. And now you have a, the five millimeter is not enough. You will have to retract it more. Sphincter may tear, but you have to get this nucleus out. This is a large nucleus, and I'm doing a 6.5 to maybe seven millimeter rexus because these kind of uh, capsules do not stretch that very well okay. because they are fibrotic ones, they are mature cataracts. So then I get the space to get out this nucleus. One pole comes out. You can do whichever way, from the left or right or clockwise or anti-clockwise. But the problem here is that the space within the bag, within the anterior chamber might be less, and so you may not be able to bring the nucleus fully out. But if more than 180 degree of the nucleus rotates, that means that it is very, very loose inside the bag. Only the temporal, I'm doing it temporal, so only the temporal half needs to be up, out into the anterior chamber. Once you get the vectus outside, you can dodge it left to right and get the whole nucleus out and then get the nucleus out. So here, the nucleus comes out very safely with all the uh, hooks on. But later on, uh, we can even see this is a very hard kind of uh, nucleus. So here, I would definitely want to have a very large rexus so that the nucleus comes out very uh, safely. So here again, staining is very important. Although you don't see the stain very much because it is very brown black, but still, as Sudhib was telling in last session, you can't see the sun. So this is called the, if you get Argentinian flag sign, it is called Botswana flag sign. <laughs> because Botswana flag is this uh, uh, black, blue, black, you know, so uh, a blue, black, blue. And then now I do a full rexus and then I take out the sub-incisional one. So already it has been stressed and it is loose there and your manipulation and taking out the nucleus and all will be a little more easy when you have the, 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 the hook away from your tunnel. Some people feel very uncomfortable having the hook under the uh, tunnel while doing this maneuver. Once this is, while this is being done, the, the part close to your incision is widely open, and so as you see, 180 degree has been rotated. So it is, e it is sure that the, uh, the lens is very mobile, and pa one part is out, and you can lift the other part very gently and bring it into the tunnel, and from there, very carefully depress and inject and bring out this huge black kind of nucleus. So here, the question is retaining the bag. Rest, all the rest are secondary. And then I'm putting the hook back in. Because, uh, because if you have the iris like that, you don't see the rexus margin. I have to see the rexus margin to get out, the, out all these cortex. These cortex, uh, you may think that it is easy to take, but they are chunks of cortex which may sit in the periphery and you will never see them. And later on, they will hydrate and come down into the anterior chamber. So again, the dilated uh, pupil is very necessary to see and identify the, rexus, the uh, hooks in the cortex uh, in the periphery and take out. This is the last one. This is slightly hypermature kind of thing, so not a very huge nucleus. So you can put three, four hooks. You can even put five, so that the tear in between the hooks are lesser. The more hooks you put, the tear between the hooks are lesser, the pupillary margin. So I make a, a adequate large rexus. Adequate rexus is at least six millimeters. Don't, don't compromise on the rexus margin. Otherwise, you'll do an ICC. You want to retain the bag, have a larger rexus. So now I release these hooks, three hooks. But after I release, I retain them inside because I know that the pupil will become smaller and I would need them later on to aspirate the cortex. So you can release them and retain them inside the chamber itself. And because they have been stressed and uh, the rigidity is lost, we can always rotate the nucleus out because the pupil is partially held and the rest has been stretched. So all three ways you can, you can try. One is retaining all the hooks, one is removing from the sub-incisional part, and one is uh, dislodging three and then re retaining it out. After, but still, every case of small pupil with the heart nucleus, I will definitely do with iris retractor hooks and the pupil dilated very well so that I visualize the rexus margin. Uh, that it is a large rexus and I do not hook the bag also out. See, under the iris, if you hook out the nucleus, sometimes you will hook out the whole bag also. You may go underneath the iris, but you will be over the capsule. So I, uh, I for me, when, when I, I do SICS mostly in these kind of uh, bad ones uh, because FACO happens more often nowadays. But when I do this, I want to make sure that my rexus is large and I do not do an ICC inverted, inadvertent. Thank you very much. Thank you, Minu. <laughs> Wonderful take home messages. User device, large rexus. Uh, next, I'll invite uh, Professor Titial. Uh, Professor Titial, uh, everyone knows, is a very skilled surgeon. You would have seen a lot of life surgery. and he practically does not use any small people devices unless I request him to demonstrate one. So, 
<laughs> so let's hear from him. Uh, Non-device options in small people. Uh, good afternoon, friends, and thank you, Subin, for in involving me in this uh, very interesting uh, instruction course. And cataract surgery is such we have to manage in any situation and make sure that you get the best outcome from your surgical skill to your patient. So let me take you through my own way of uh, dealing with a small pupil. I think it is very important to manage your patient preoperatively because if you see your patient has uh, a small pupil history of, you know, patient having uh, to taking uh, anti-process medications, otherwise showing the difficult uh, signs of difficult surgery like iris atrophy, pupillary distortion, intraocular lens not in a proper position. So you have to make sure your pre-op pre management is proper. Normally we like to use, you know, NSA drops two or three days before if possible and uh, good cycloplegic dilatation on the day of surgery. Always look for a dilatation pre-op which is, should be effective enough. Or pe many people dilate now, nowadays intraoperatively also. But normally I like to add to intraoperative dilatation for these people. If needed, you must use pupil expanders, hooks or rings is compulsory to have a better visible area for your surgery also. So this is a study we did for uh, you know, NSAID uh, use before uh, surgery, bronchopenic, uh, to see how much is the effective concentration in the anterior chamber for these uh, anti-inflammatory you know, uh, drugs being done. So we gave them five days before and subsequently analyzed them in a every uh, 12 hours, 24 hours. So we realized that even a single dose is effective if you have given one or three days before. So even if you give a two hours before the surgery, you have enough concentration in the anterior chamber for these medications. So they are very, very effective to decrease the intraop uh, midriasis and post-op pain in these cases. Irrigation solution, you might add no adrenaline in that, diluted one. If needed, you can always compensate with that. We always talk about disco dilatation, which is also important part in uh, managing small pupil. So this is one, as we talked about, you have to really see which is the rigid, which is the floppy pupil. And floppy pupil will definitely re require a further you know, management in these cases also. So this is a, I'm doing a clear call incision. Uh, then you'll see when I'm injecting the viscoelastic to maintain the intra uh, AC uh, depth for uh, my rexis, you'll see the flutter in the pupillary margin. Just see here. I said, go see that flutter. That means your dilatation has not been appropriate. So I'll put a little viscoelastic. This is cohesive viscoelastic. Then I'll go with uh, adrenaline underneath the visc uh, viscoelastic cover and see the dilatation here. So you have to make sure these uh, medicine don't hit your endothelium. So it always should be done under the viscoelastic cover. So that is one important thing you should learn. And now I have a nice dilatation. I can do my procedure effectively in these patients also. So this is, I think, almost 10, 15 years back, my surgery, where uh, uh, enthusiastically I should do for a you know, uh, small pupil, also phaco. And the challenge here is to do a rexis which is large enough, which you can't see. So that's a major challenge. So if you are lucky, your movements of a rexis rotation will be convenient as, as you are under your control. And you can complete the rexis safely in these cases also. See, this pupil will not uh, you know, budge. This is a fixed pupil. So I'm sure during my entire FICO procedure, this pupil will not constrict. So a little bit of a uh, viscoelastic uh, injection will increase a little bit to around 3.5 to 4 millimeter, which is, uh, you know, I thought sufficient size for doing a good capsular rexis in this patient. So you, I'll, I'll go with the rexis as of routinely done in these patients, needle cystitome rexis. You can use microfossils because your rotations are hidden under the pupillary margin. So there you have to be... Uh, quite effectively seeing this. If possible, you must you know, stain these capsules so that you can see visible of a tearing of this happening here. You can see, I can see the nice flab rotation. I'm going underneath the pupillary margin. This will be around four millimeter rexis, not large enough, uh, which may be sufficient to uh, complete your phaco mystification. But this may be the indication for all of us to use device because this size is not actually a good size for a completion of phaco. And uh, all these cases, the hydro procedure becomes little difficult to manage. You can see I'm trying to do hydro dissection. When I'm actually doing the FACO, I realize my dissections are not proper. So there, normally, we have to make an initial chop, separate the pieces, allow the internal hydro delineation to happen in these cases, and subsequently, you can complete the emulsification. All these cases, once you do a more hydro procedures, you are going to leave a larger epicortical uh, tissue also, and that is 
gets very difficult to remove under a, a small pupil. So I remove the loose cortex here that I'll do a, a take home vacation this time. I'll space rotation doesn't happen. You can see the rotation will be difficult in this particular case because delineation is not complete. So you have to take out this piece again and make sure uh, it, it is completely you know, detached from the central area. Eat this and the subsequent uh, procedure will be effectively done. Now I have a space to take care of that. And always make sure your hand piece doesn't touch the pupillary margin. Because that is a very high chance that you might touch it, you might hold it. So that effectivity you have to learn because this is slightly deviation from the large pupil surgery cases. And your opening should be not too big also. Sleeve should not be too far off. Otherwise, uh, you have a chances of catching. Now, this is another important area. Now, this half is, has to be pulled into the central area. So what I'll do, I'll use my second instrument, try to pull it. So this is just uh, little pressure. It will rotate. And subsequently, I can complete this surgery also. So this is a, a typical management of a case where a hydro procedure was not uh, effectively completed. Subsequently, you can do a nice emulsification in these cases also. This is the last piece I have. And in, in fact, a small pupil gives the opportunity like uh, most of the FACO can be done in you know, some pupillary plane because you, you know that plane in these cases quite effectively. Because if you have full dilatation, you are not sure which is your plane for emulsification of these patients also. So this is a challenge now, a small pupil now. This thick epicortical tuition is very difficult to remove and you may require to do a juggling in these cases you can see large, thick tissues there. Sometimes, you, in normal cases, I would have taken this with the FACO handpiece because thick tissue, you can pull it and little FACO and you can take out the entire thing also. And especially this area is very, very difficult where I'll have to use the bimanual system to take out the peripheral area also. So you can see I'm trying to take out everything here and then implantation can be done effectively in these patients also. So this is another case of a similar small pupil case with the history of a patient taking, you know, uh, uh, Flomax for a prostate uh, surgery. The pupil is little, you can see, uh, uh, floppy. I could do a nice 4.5 millimeter rexis. So these cases, uh, normally you have to maintain the low fluidix so that uh, there's a not much of a chamber deviation happening during your procedure. Make sure entire hydro procedure is good. And you can complete the FACO. This is slightly softer cataract. And you can do a nice chopping, complete the entire area. And this is a case where uh, your implantation is for a toric eye well. And you know that toric eye well needs the visibility of those three dots which are there and near optic haptic junction. So once I remove the entire thing, I'll inject the viscoelastic. You can just see the axial margin here. And implantation should be such, which gives you appreciation that you have implanted normally. If you can't see the both the you know, dots either side, then things can be difficult. Then you may have to retract the pupillary margin, or sometimes you may have to use iris hooks also. But this pupil I could maintain for a quite a you know, reasonable time during FACO. I'm trying to remove the viscoelastic from behind. Then towards the end, you'll see uh, I could see the dots here, and that made life easier. So anything, a small pupil, if you can see either a one end of uh, optic haptic junction, where uh, you can see this is the area I can see here, I, it's not visible. You're pretty sure your lens is well aligned. Otherwise, I'll have to retract this and see w w where exactly my, you know, uh, the lens is placed in these cases also. This is a small video uh, to see the floppy iris case. You can see the already the, you know, uh, in the side for the pupil is getting dragged. That means there's a floppiness is there. So I'll take out the low fluidics, my second hand piece chopper inject dispersive viscoelastic bolus there. Because this dispersive viscoelastic remains there, it doesn't come out very easily. And this bolus will maintain the pupil not to get you know, deviated from that area. I could complete my surgery. So sometimes if I know my patient has a little floppy iris, I normally put uh, dispersive bolus at this area and this area where my instrumentation are going to be there. This is my last video to show that I use device also sometimes. So this is a case I thought I can do it around three millimeter, this thing, and it was again a rigid pupil, patient with pseudo exfoliation and uh, planned for a toric eye well. I thought I can do it. I, I could do the rexis also, which was around 3.5 millimeter. But then realized this is a you know, toric eye well implantation, that too in a pseudo exfoliation cases, where you all know uh, the pumosis uh, chances are much, much higher. So this is what do I normally do a six uh, a small uh, one millimeter uh, stab incisions. 
insert all the hooks first, then one by one slowly titrate the you know, pupillary margin so that don't damage the sphincter that much. Sub-incisional uh, is a very, very important area. They see that I'm, I'm dilating one by one. And the typical hexagonal appearance seen with the, any pupillary expansion devices here. You can see my rexes are around three millimeter, so I have to enlarge. That means from the small pupil rexes, the rex is not sufficient large enough. So you, it is better idea to make it uh, visible area bigger so you can manage the case better also. And you can see my stab is a little posterior, therefore they are parallel to iris plane and doesn't tent, uh, which is a very important uh, way to uh, uh, put these hooks in these cases. So normally I'll put six hooks rather than four nowadays and complete the surgery. One thing is once I implant the uh, toric lens here, I will remove the viscoelastic from underneath the lens first and align my lens with the viscoelastic off. So this is a nick I normally give in a patient where there are high chances of uh, fibrosis happening just to break the circle in these cases without jeopardizing the space of a bag. Take out the viscoelastic, place the lens in a proper position. Then, now I have no viscoelastic and then I'll put some viscoelastic over the lens, take out all the hooks. So this gives me a space for a nicely taking out all the hooks and lens is stable, there's no viscoelastic behind. Subsequently, I'll just take out the viscoelastic from the anterior chamber through over the lens and your lens remains uh, static. Because sometimes small pupil, uh, con pupil might constrict, you know, uh, when you take out the hooks, then subsequent placement of toric valve may be difficult. So this is a small step which moderation can be done with uh, better outcome. So I would say small pupil managed with NS8 first, maybe post-op also you have to enhance your steroid and NS8 for a slightly longer time because you may have done more manipulations. Identify type of pupil, intracamular drugs can be used. Always do a you know, uh, low fluid extraction. Biomanual procedures, aspiration is very, very effective in a small pupil, floppy pupil, and gives a very nice way to look into these cases also. This is our book coming this year uh, through JP Brothers, being launched in AIOS this time. Simplifying the IOL power calculation in your hands. Very small book, you can go through all the IOL power formulas within a, you know, within a you know, few pages. Thank you for a kind listening. Thank you very much, Professor Tiel, for wonderfully demonstrating non-device uh, options in small people. Uh, another request, uh, Dr. Arup Chakravarti, to speak on IFIS. Uh, once we're done with these general topics, we'll go on to specific devices. So Dr. Arup uh, needs uh, no, no introduction again. He's been teaching for a very long time. So let's hear him on IFIS. So uh, very good afternoon, friends, and uh, thank you, Suvan, for uh, calling me for yet another of your very popular courses on small people, which uh, you have been giving all over the country and, and international fora. So I have uh, modified uh, my topic uh, a little bit, and I call it IFIS Revisited. So the video that you see is actually uh, the last in the series of uh, very graphic, uh, you know, intraoperative people, intra uh, small pupil surgery. And this was done about 15 or 20 years back, and subsequently it uh, came to be known as IFIS. That time we ah, didn't yeah, know. Right. Uh, since then, when the first uh, 2005, when uh, David Chang and Campbell described IFIS, and subsequently there's been a lot of inputs in the literature to measure meta-analysis have come up, and I've learned from experience. I've developed an SOP for myself, and I have not, uh, not encountered any such case in my surgical practice. And I'm going to just share with you the SOP which I have been following. And that's a dynamic SOP. It, it, it keeps changing depending upon newer information in the literature and you know, my own personal experience. So basically, a little bit about uh, what happened in this, uh, what was described in this 2005 article. So it was noticed that uh, all, all these BPH patients who were put on uroselective uh, block, uh, alpha-1 blockers, you know, that alpha-1A particularly, you know, they, that was tamsulosin. So they demonstrated IFIS, uh, the features which uh, was known as intraoperative flop floppy iris syndrome. These are the same receptors which are present in the eye, in the, in the dilator muscles, and those muscles also got blocked by tamsulosin, and this is what was happening. And subsequently, it was noticed that there are many other mon uh, medications, many other you know, systemic medications were also responsible for a similar situation. So today, when I come across a small pupil situation, I classify uh, them into two categories. One is the non-IFIS type, that is the traditional type, 
and IFS type of small people on patients who are potential BPA, potential IFS candidate, BPH patients, uh, need not be BPH, but there are a host list of other medications that also have to be taken into account. Uh, it, it is also important to know that, you know, IFS people, IFS candidates may not have small people to start with. They can have a large, relatively large people to start with. So other medications that have been implicated are, you know, for example, psilodocin, which is again a uroselective uh, uh, alpha blocker. So that is even worse than tamsulosin. So today, if I have to start a patient, if a neurologist asks me that uh, I would, uh, which uh, uh, alpha blocker should I start my patient on, I would say it is alfuzosin. This is not uroselective. This is non-specific type, but it, uh, unlike the other, you know, uh, non-selective uh, uh, alpha blockers, this does not give us to postural hypotension, which was the major problem with the other me medications because of the slow GI absorption profile. Then antipsychiatric medications like benzodiazepines, QTPN, and uh, also are also implicated. So we definitely uh, take look into a drug history. So this is what we have a, ma a matrix, matrix which is put up in my preoperative counseling room. And in, in spite of all the best efforts, there are some patients who, who still get through this mesh, you know, through, through this uh, mesh work. And uh, we finally find out that, you know, they have uh, you know, forgotten the history of transcendence intake. So these are the two major meta-analyses which I have used to develop my SOP. One came in 2011 and 2022. 2022 meta-analysis basically confirmed whatever we had known about IFS earlier. And then it came up with uh, newer, some, some newer concepts. What we had known earlier that it is more common in the male sex. Of course, the female patients also can develop uh, uh, IFS. Hypertensive patients, whether it is hypertension per se or the antihypertensive therapy that was responsible. And another concept that came up was decreased dilated pupil diameter. I find it extremely important, and that is my sole criteria today as to you know, how we go ahead in a, in a patient, in IFS candidate. And again, in the anti-psychotic medications, et cetera, et cetera. So uh, another interesting uh, concept, another in uh, summary from this particular meta-analysis was some of these conventional prophylactic measures that people have been taking. So for example, discontinuation of tamsulosin. I don't do it personally, but there are some people who have been doing it use of preoperative topical atropine, using intracamel epinephrine or preop topical NSAIDs. You know, statistically, they have no uh, significance. Uh, so, you, I mean, so though we do it, but still, you know, statistically, it is not proven to be very useful. Preop pupil dilated, uh, preop dilated pupil diameter. Say, for example, uh, studies have shown that if your pupil doesn't dilate beyond 8 millimeters or, six or 7 millimeters or 6.5 millimeters, they become IFS candidate. So it is very cumbersome, and you keep the patient waiting in the OP and you know, dilate and measure it. And measuring measurement protocol of also is quite cumbersome. So I use the intuitive pupil uh, to intuitive uh, pupil to limbal diameter, and this basically on the surgical table, I measure. I, I just get an estimate of what is the pupillary diameter, what is the limbal diameter, get the ratio. If the ratio ratio appears to me less than 60 percent, I treat this patient as an IFS candidate. So in that case, I would be using P plus ultra or phenocan plus, no financial interest. Both these medications do extremely well for all these potential IFS candidates. And if I have a very small pupil to start with, like what you see here with comorbidity, and a fellow had not done well in terms of IFS uh, manifestations and management, so I definitely be using a pupillary device. And my go-to pupillary device in this case, of course, would be a iris uh, hook because you know, iris hooks also takes care of the peripheral iris prolapse unlike a ring device which, is, which just enlarges view centrally, but the iris still is popping on the peripheral side. So I won't show the video, but this was a, a case which I had you know, who developed IFS in spite of all these precautions, and you know, patient did extremely well postoperatively. In a week's time, she, she had a vision of 6.6. This is a video that I would like to show you. So here, uh, uh, temp it was a, again an IFS candidate. So Saurabh had shown a similar case. You know? So temporarily, there is a, a tendency for iris prolapse, so here, instead of dep depositing the iris from the main incision, I go through the side port, and then I create a paracentesis incision a little behind the original incision, as you see here. And then I push in my iris hook, so that iris hook, it, it, it retracts the pupillary margin, and it, it uh, takes the iris away from harm's way, so that subsequently FECO handpiece can be easily inserted, and the uh, intraocular lens can be easily inserted, and surgery goes off uneventfully. So the sub-incisional iris, Hook definitely is a very good concept in managing an you know, iris prolapse from the main incision. So basically, for mild to moderate IFS, I would, you know, follow the, you know, this precaution to make a very good incision. For that matter, you should make very good incision in all your cases. The lower IA flow parameters, appropriate OVD strategy, 
And severe cases, of course, we go for a ring device, uh, two-way dilating device or an eye ratio. So, friend, cataract surgeon should be aware of the identified uh, factors predisposing to IPS, which we have come uh, by studying the various meta-analysis. Properly assess and evaluate these to stratify the surgical risk in a given patient. Use all the necessary pre-op and intraoperative measures in high-risk patients to achieve an adequately dilated pupil intraoperatively. And failing to do so could turn a routine surgery into one of significant uh, visual morbidity. Thank you so much for your kind attention. Thank you, Dr. Arup. And thank you for finishing before time. So I'll next invite Dr. Sudeep Das. I'll expect the speakers to all stay back so that we can have a discussion if, it, if time permits. Uh, Dr. Sudeep Das is in Ganjam and again uh, leads a hospital which does a lot of high volume work. So uh, Dr. Sudeep will speak on iris hook, pearls and pitfalls. Thank you so, on, uh, so much, Suvan. And I don't have any financial disclosures to make. So coming to the advantages of iris hooks, of course, they are way cheaper than any of the other devices, as a relatively shorter learning curve compared to the other devices. And it can be used uh, in very shallow ACs also. Normal shallow, yeah, it's possible to use other devices. But uh, why is this not moving? So they can be a little dangerous because you have chances that they'll probably, if they get dislodged and all, they might touch the corneal endothelium. The other advantage is that if you think that they might there might be some subluxation, you can actually shift the hooks from the pupillary margin to the rexus margin. And of course, this is not ideal, but it's probably a lot of places it's done. You can ETO and re-sterilize them. Disadvantage is that they tend to create uh, sphincter tears and make, uh, give a slightly irregular pupil postoperatively. And in atrophic iris, they can really tear, you know, up to the limbus. And if you're not careful, you can tear the anterior capsule also, especially if you're using reused hooks because they open up. They're difficult to use in presence of, uh, you know, in small eyes, it's a bit difficult to use. And they tend to get dislodged. I'll show one of those. But you can sort of uh, cut off uh, the, uh, the external part beyond the bung, uh, beyond, beyond the silicon, the silicon bung, and they won't get dislodged after that. Then the other thing is the iris is lifted up by these hooks. You can reduce the amount it gets dented up by making the incisions a little posterior. And uh, applying a hook posterior to the phaco wound, you can sort of avoid that. And so one is sort of uh, just behind scleral, as it was already shown, to the posterior uh, to the phaco wound. And then you can use three or four more iris hooks elsewhere. So this was a post trabeculectomy patient with a lot of uh, sinicae. <coughs> And uh, as you can see, I make uh, all the openings before I do anything. So I make my side ports, I make my uh, the in incisions for the iris hooks, everything one shot before I have introduced any viscoelastic or anything. And then uh, there's a trepan glue. So I've already made the entry for the iris hook sclerally, and uh, then I actually made the phaco wound anterior to it. So here I'm releasing the sinicare. And if you see I'm using a Sinsky, I have absolutely no use for iris repositors or anything like that in my practice. So this is scleral, as you can see. It's going behind the phaco wound. You can make it after making the phaco incision also. So these you can use, uh, th these you can see are, obviously you can make out, they have been reused. So they are little open. So when you have something like this, you are a little careful because they have more tendencies to damage. So if you see, I keep them slightly sideways. I don't point them towards the anterior capsule. So they're slightly tilted to the side. So they're not actually engaging the anterior capsule, which is a good idea even in uh, brand new iris hooks. So basically there are five iris hooks. This is ideal in complicated cases. And then of course the surgery is uh, very routine. 
and then implant the uh, eye hole of whatever your choice and then uh, remove the iris hooks. So for uh, removing the iris hooks, basically to disengage it from the iris and rotate it towards the cornea, it sort of almost automatically come out. You don't have to struggle with trying to remove it. So just rotate it over the cornea and it'll come out. So this was uh, an SICS with uh, iris hooks and this was extremely rigid, extremely sort of friable iris, very thinned out iris. So again, so here I would sort of prefer, now I would prefer to use five iris hooks in most SICS and one can remove the superior iris hooks when one is removing this, here I didn't. Uh, but you can see because of the, you know, how thin the iris was, the state of the iris after that, it doesn't matter. It was like complicated cataract, at least you can see the fundus after that. This was another complicated cataract. And the difference here is that there is a sort of a membrane over the pupillary area also. So you can see it's not a rexis that I'm doing, I'm actually removing the pupillary membrane. And that is very important before, you know, doing this. So I could have actually stretched the iris a bit more uh, with uh, two hooks. I didn't do that. And because I'm doing that, you'll notice later that I've sort of damaged the anterior capsule in one, uh, in one place. And I'm actually not expanding the iris, uh, the pupil fully. Because if it's a phaco, you really don't need to. So you can do it stage-wise. Here I wanted it under the phaco wound, I wanted it to be expanded a bit more. But then I realized once I do this, that I sort of torn the anterior capsule, so I wanted to expand the pupil fully to be able to do a rexis from that point where I sort of torn the rexis, which is here. So once you have any problem, there is, uh, you shouldn't hesitate. You should just make your visu visualization easy and very, very soft cataract. So anyway, that is, uh, but if I had sort of not expanded it fully and let the tear be, then probably I would have had problems. This is uh, basically, you know, how you make the incisions and how you remove the, uh, so this is the traditional way, if it's at the limbus. Making them slightly more posterior, your iris is not lifted up, but yes, there is a problem that, so this has to go into the sclera because your phaco wound will come at the limbus. The others can also go through the sclera if I suspect that I may need, there may be, uh, so again, just rotate it and it comes out. So no struggle at all. I find some of my fellows really struggling to remove these. It's very simple. You can actually point the uh, hook upwards also and it becomes even easier. So just release it, rotate it and just push it a little forward or backwards, whatever the case may be, and it comes out. This was uh, another case where the pupil was really small and had no idea what the lens was behind it. And then I realized when I'm doing the rexis that the lens is moving. So in this case, I move the hooks from uh, the iris margin to the rexis margin. And here I cut the, uh, the, make the hook shorter so that it doesn't sort of uh, interfere with uh, the, the eye moving. And then, so this was a FACO, I mean, sorry, uh, SICS, but in these cases, probably I'd prefer to do a FACO when there is a little bit of subluxation. So this was uh, probably the first pupillary dilating device that was described. It's still very useful to use. And uh, reuse hooks are wider and tend to cause more capsular damage. Uh, 
and do not expand the pupil to beyond six millimeters if it's a phaco. So, so then it looks fairly all right after you remove the, uh, the hooks also. And this uh, may not be practical for, uh, you know, a manual SICS where you need to, of course, expand it limbus to limbus. Otherwise, uh, you cannot really dislocate the nucleus out. Uh, and sphincter price is just a small uh, price to pay for uh, uh, safe surgery. And unlike other pupillary dilating devices, iris hooks, as you saw, can be used to support the capsular bag intraoperatively. Thank you. Thank you very much, Sudeep. Uh, wonderful tips on iris hooks. And I can see uh, people are, I mean, uh, still taking pictures over here. So that means iris hooks also, there is a lot of learning curve. And there is a lot to learn. There are finer points which uh, Sudeep dealt with. Uh, he'll be here for uh, discussions. Uh, now I'll be speaking on. I'll be speaking on one, please. Yeah. So I'm Subhan Bhattacharya, and I'll be speaking on BHEX and other pupil expanders. I do have a financial interest in the BHEX pupil expander. Yeah. So uh, as a matter of courtesy, we'll first deal with the other devices, and we'll come to the BHEX uh, towards the end. So my concerns with iris hooks are a few. Uh, the multiple incisions, at least theoretically, would lead to more risk of infection, the iris sphincter tear, and the fact that the corner spaces are actually wasted. The entire pupil is lifted to the limbal plane, so there is an anti-flexion of the iris also, and it comes in the way of uh, your uh, FACO probe and other devices, or other instruments that you're using. Uh, iris hooks do take a little more time than uh, rings. It's a published paper in JCRS in uh, 2019. And of course, if you've had a struggle with iris hooks, it will leave permanent marks over there. Can I have the audio, please? So this is a malugan ring where the, can I have the audio, please? Let me see if the, yeah, there you go. The process of loading and then uh, deploying it. Now, there is a learning curve associated with it because it requires considerable skill. And uh, engaging the scrolls to the pupil margin does require a little effort. And when you leave it, leave it. I'll, I'll, I'll do, deal with it. Leave it. So, and uh, removal is actually a little tricky. It requires a little experience because those uh, scrolls can watch that this uh, uh, scroll over there. And that can, you don't have control on that scroll because it can catch the iris unpredictably. Audio. The scrolls are like torsion springs with a gap so, and act as a compression spring too, and hence can crush or release the iris unpredictably. It is fundamentally wrong to attempt inserting a biplanar scroll through a slit incision. That is why an injector is required to prevent snagging of the incision. Now, this is a, a video by Thomas Oting, and this was in the early days of Malugan ring, but still holds good, because there are certain things with the Malugan ring which are beyond your control. Uh, the retraction, as I said, the scrolls can uh, snag that incision and also twist a little unpredictably. Now, there are ways uh, to go about it and uh, uh, remove it, but it still remains a challenge because the entire mechanics is, uh, you cannot predict the, uh, the gap between the uh, scrolls. If you look at that, that's a nasty situation where it got stuck and then it has to be cut and removed. Now, this is the APX device. It's basically double iris hooks through two additional incisions instead of four. It's a pretty bulky device, so it hasn't really gained popularity. And it's got a tough uh, spring, which is a uh, little difficult to manip manipulate. Uh, this is the Expand NT-Iris Speculum. It's an ethanol uh, autoclavable. It has a high profile of 1.4 millimeters. Uh, so the biplanar structure actually again it snags the incision. It's it's a struggle to put it in without an injector. So if you see the basically all the injectors came in place to avoid this problem of snagging because all these devices were biplanar devices. So snagging is the reason why all these people expanders re required a injector. So as with the expand NT now once they've gotten an injector it was a little easier to inject it without snagging. But then controlling it was a little uh, difficult. And again, this hasn't been very popular, though it can be reused. It's nitinol, it's got memory, but then it's, it's a little cumbersome to use. 
and again removal can be a little challenge. This is the uh, eye ring from Beaver Visitic. Uh, this has uh, been used a uh, little, but again, it's a fairly bulky device, which has got a high uh, vertical profile. And so it's made of polyurethane and it's got uh, live hinges. Uh, now in the, the periphery, remember the antechamber is shallower. So 1.5 millimeter can be a little ask over there. Uh, Kanabrava's ring uh, by Sergio Kanabrava. Uh, again, uh, this is PMMA, so it's pretty rigid. Uh, it's difficult to handle, bulky, and it would work in some cases, but would not be very favorable in some other cases. There are some flanges which are below the iris and with some which go above. Uh, it does not, uh, is not really versatile, so to say. So we conducted an online survey in, uh, then somewhere in, in, towards the end of the COVID, first COVID, and uh, we were surprised to know that the BX People Expander was pretty popular, and uh, despite the fact that the BX is uh, four times that of iris hooks, India, 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 India. <laughs> if it was out, <laughs> I would have quit ophthalmology practice by, by now <laughs> if it was worldwide. <laughs> so, so, so BX People Expander is it's a very thin device, 75 microns. It's got flanges and notches and flanges. It's just 75 microns, thinner than a hair. Okay, and it's extremely flexible, resiliently flexible. It serves both the purposes, and we recommend the. BX 23 gauge forceps, you need me to check if it's a genuine one or not. The beauty of the forceps is that the, sque uh, the jaws open in a plane perpendicular to the squeeze handle, that's what makes it different, and it's ergonomically designed for the anterior chamber. The VR forceps are actually pretty long and they can get damaged. <laughs> now, this is, like I said, it's uh, we are registered, it's 75 microns, uh, six notches, six flanges. Uh, you do not require an injector. Like I said, injectors were required because to cover, overcome the problem of snagging. You do not require an injector, you just need to hold it with the forceps and does not require any skill. All anterior segment surgeons are pretty well, pretty versatile, well versed with use of forceps, micro forceps, and it's entirely in a single plane, and the iris bends at the notches. On other devices, the device bends, and the iris remains the same plane. Here, that's what is different. That's why you can take it out to very small incisions. I'll be showing that to you shortly. You can take it out to a one millimeter side port incision, uh, this we have already covered. So this is a regular 1.8 or larger incision. There is no problem inserting the device. Just inject a little viscoelastic under the pupil margin to allow room for it. You may choose to put viscoelastic over there. Just grab that flange, leading flange, put it in the AC, tuck one flange, the next alternate flange, and then the third flange. No real rocket science, no uh, real uh, learning curve or great skill required. It uh, provides you a 5.5 millimeter pupil, which is enough for any FACO surgery. Uh, so the, the Deepak has put up certain videos which are very hard cataract, and you can see 5.5 is quite adequate. <laughs> so it allows you easy movement of your devices. You don't feel the presence of the device because it's flush with the iris, and uh, your instru instruments can, FACO probe, uh, IA probe can go in and out without any hindrance at all. IOL injection also is equally easy. You can go under the IOL, remove the viscoelastic, and do whatever you feel like. You're, it, you do not have to alter your surgical steps at all. Now, this is, uh, can be inserted even through a 1.2 millimeter incision. Only thing is you need to align that, uh, see if you keep that uh, flange across the incision, it doesn't go in very easily. Once you hold it at the, the end, it can go in, and you align it to the incision, it can go in through a 1.2 millimeter incision. And removal, like I said, it can come out through a 1.9 or side, uh, side port incision. You just need to grab that flange over there and advance it centrally. So you disengage the two notches and you just draw the device out, walks out of the incision. No device can help you achieve that. And you can remove it, uh, lots of surgeons are preferring hydro implantation these days, so you can remove the device under uh, irrigation as well. Only thing you need to remember is to keep holding the device. Once the device is disengaged from the iris, you can't let it loose because it's gonna spin in the anterior chamber. Uh, we will. Uh, go fast over here, I think my time's up. So uh, you require a 5.5 and nothing more. So this is Dr. Deepak Meghur, and if you can see, this is a pretty hard cataract, and as you see him chopping it, so all that you need to do is chop it into small fragments and you can go about. Intraop meiosis, again, the BHEX is the only device which allows you direct visualization of the capsular excess margin as you engage the flanges. You can tuck the flanges and draw them to the periphery, and as you do that, you have instant confirmation 
that you have not engaged that capsular excess margin. That's the beauty. You can see at every time what exactly is happening, and you can change the course if you require. And welcome uh, this is, to the it's 20th a annual for me to have AAO Dr. David Chang Spotlight on Cataract Complications. This in, uh, the AO. And this ring is very popular so uh, in Asia. That a little. Sorry. This ring uh, comes out really easy. It's flimsy, it's thin, uh, and we uh, pull it right out. And there is a video available on uh, the AO website, which is, uh, shows the device being used in a tube shunt. Uh, just with a single incision, you know, all the flanges were maneuvered, and uh, gone, the, the surgeon was able, Dr. Michael Henry and Deepak Edward, and they showed this beautifully, where you see now, right now, this flange is going to be taken around the tube shunt, which you can see here, and tucked under the pupil margin. So that allowed safe surgery, even in the presence of a tube shunt. It's been used in posterior segment surgery. This was an award-winning video by Dr. Dulal Chakraborty, and I'll just show you where it helped them see a peripheral break over there, and that, that's the break, and that helped them in their surgery, so it's been used quite extensively now in VR surgery. So what your choice would be depends entirely on you if you want to use a thin device, but yes, in rigid pupils, you need to actually stretch that pupil to make it favorable for the BX. We have a few publications in international journals, and I'd highly recommend that you, if you're using the device, you look at this. This is often, I'm, I post this on WhatsApp groups, and it's available on our website for download also. This has got video links. Thank you very much for your kind attention. I'll now invite Dr. Deepak Megur uh, to speak on pseudoexfoliation and small pupil. Is it on? Existing, but we need to understand that you know, apart from just the pupil, uh, the zonular compromise, health of the zonular compromise would be significant in these patients. So, uh, apart from the pupil, we are also concerned of the zonular health in dealing with uh, pseudo exfoliation. To deal with the pupil, as has been discussed, we have got many options, iris hooks, uh, which were the initial uh, choices for all of us. Then we based on uh, ring based devices. And uh, this is an 80-year-old uh, man who has got pseudo exfoliation, loose zonules, a rigid pupil. So one way to go around in this very thin uh, thing is you want to pre-stretch the pupil so that you get better midriasis when you are using a BX device. Because as it is very thin and flimsy, its ability to stretch the pupil on its own might be difficult. But another advantage of using uh, a, a any device to actually stretch is once you stretch, the iris can become floppy. So to prevent that, to hold it in place, you, these devices work very well. So if you are dealing with a rigid pupil, you have to pre-stretch a little bit before using these, uh, uh, the BX ring so that you get better midriasis. And uh, uh, it is not, there is a short learning curve or for it, and the one trick I would like to say is, you know, always stabilize the globe with a second hand. So because eye does not move from primary position, you see well when you're trying to engage them. So most of the beginners, when they try to do it, the eye would be rotating, and they'd not be figuring out where the, uh, the uh, pupillary margin is, and they'll be struggling for it, uh, especially when the visualization is challenging because of thick carcass or uh, uh, cornea, which is not great. So always in the moment we touch the capsule, that is the, si that is the time in which we really know the health of the zonules. Until then, we really can't know. So be very attentive uh, in eyes with pseudo exfoliation. And hydrodissection is probably the most important step which will tell you that you know how good or bad the zonular health is. So I would prefer to insert a CTR before. As you saw, I was first creating some space by injecting OVD inside. And with the nucleus inside, you know, uh, the uh, CTR could be managed. What it gives an advantage is that it provides us 360 degree you know, equatorial support uh, as you're maneuvering with these denser nucleus. So in such situations, uh, if the zonules are a little bit iffy, I wouldn't hesitate to go ahead and insert the CTR a little bit earlier than what conventionally has been taught to us. So again, you know, your nucleus division process all are going to be standard, and then uh, you're going to place the lens as you have been planned. And as it has been always uh, discussed, you know, one of the greatest advantage of this uh, device is the thin profile, and uh, because of that, the removal is quite easy. So other things are biplanar you have. You can also remove them with forceps, but there's always a thing that it gets snagged at the pupillar margin or the wound itself. There's a way around it, you just press it down and pull it out, but that's it. And the pupil never gets distorted or you have a cosmetically better looking pupil. Now, at this point, I'd like to just 
show you, this was a classical place, and there are some difficult situations like you get into and you have a ring inside. Now, how do you deal with such situations? I just like to take you through. So this is a pseudo exfoliation case, and once the nucleus is uh, come out, suddenly the eye becomes hard now. Now, this is because there's a fluid misdirection, there is a uh, compromised zonules, and I can't proceed with, you know, a cortex extraction. You can see the tiny lens particles behind it, uh, suggesting of the fluid which has gone behind, and the eye is tense because the fluid is in the burger space, and uh, uh, there's total uh, you know, lack of space for me to proceed further. So uh, I'm struggling to introduce my cannulas inside, and it is a situation where I'm more likely to break the posterior capsule at this stage. So at this stage, you know, surgery temporarily suspended. I start mannitol, wait for about 15 to 20 minutes after <coughs> about half of the mannitol is over, and then you can see that the eye softens a little bit. And the BX ring is still on. I'm not done anything. I'm just waiting in the OR. And using cohesive OVD, you can deepen the chamber and then insert in the CPR. The lens goes in place. Uh, and then you are going to remove the, this thing. And whenever you have this iris prolapse, avoid pushing it many times inside. Okay, just if it comes out, just leave it there. Work under very low pressure. Retract the iris. Try to align it in the desired axis. This is a toric lens. And you'll be surprised that the iris still retains its uh, cosmetic appearance. The another case of you know similar fluid misdirection where the patient just moves the eye, I have a small PC tear, and this has still escaped my attention. And you can see the piercing capsule blows out, and the second ring appears now. The second ring is the anterior hyaluronic rupture. So there was an interval between the first posterior capsular tear and the anterior hyaluronic rupture. It took some time. And if you're not alert, this is because I wasn't too attentive. I could have prevented the anterior hyaluronic rupture, but it wasn't to be. So naturally, the vitreous prolapse is there. You're going to deal with the vitreous prolapse. I'm just showing like if you end up having a complicated situation with the BX ring also, it is an actually an advantage. Imagine if this complication has happened and your pupil has come down, then you'll be in a lot of problem. So do vitrectomy. I'm just tripping, trimming the posterior capsule tear so that the visual axis is just cleared off. And uh, now I need to place the lens in the sulcus. Uh, I'm placing a multi-piece lens, creating space under the iris using a, a, a sodium hyaluronate. Enlarging the uh, incision is a great uh, tip here because I would be soft after vitrectomy. And then you guide the uh, distal haptic under the iris and above the capsule and gently dial the lens inside. So even with the ring on in a compromised situation also, you can do and position the lens where you want because the visibility uh, is great and is not compromised. And many times there's a question always asked that if the BX ring is there, uh, will it uh, the haptic it just get stuck in such complicated situations where the space is less? Uh, it doesn't really so, you know. You just create some space with OVD and you can manage it well. And here in this situation, I'm achieving optic capture uh, under the irrigation itself. And in usually I prefer to remove the BX ring under OVD itself. But in this case, uh, I the OVD is already out, the irrigation is still on, and in this situation, I'm just disengaging and trying to remove it under hydro in itself. There is a small risk here because sometimes you may end up causing adjustment detachment and all those things using under irrigation itself. So my preference is always going to be used under OVD, but in such situations, you can do it. And uh, these, uh, and so, okay, BX ring for most routine cases, fine, but iris hooks do have a role in play for in my practice as well. So whenever situations where we want a larger pupil, for example, Rexis has gone to the periphery or we have a peripheral posterior capsular tear where you're not able to visualize it well or you want to convert from FACO to SI case. Now, this is a patient where the pupil is extremely rigid and the Rexis has gone radial. This is a one-eyed patient. I wouldn't want to risk anything. The BX ring comes out and you're going and putting it your five rings and then you're able to see well where the Rexis margin is and you can position your uh, lens appropriately and ultimately the visual outcome would be better. Similar situation, be you have a situation of a peripheral posterior capsular tear. The BX device cannot give us a visualization in that particular quadrant. So the best situation in this would always not to hesitate to use iris hooks. It gives the uh, necessary visualization. Where is the tear? Where is the excess margin? You do a nice vitrectomy, and then under direct visualization, you can always go in and place the haptic over the excess margin, even these complex situations also. So the moral of the story is you need to be uh, well-versed with using as many tools as you can, and depending on those situations, choose them wisely. Thank you for attention. Thank you very much, Dr. Deepak. We have just finished on time, but though we got the uh, hall a little late, uh, if there is a quick, quick question, we could answer that, or we could take the questions after the session. No question. 
If there are no questions, we'll uh, call this session to close. And thank you very much for being here. Thank you, speakers, for being here with us every year with this.